Can God be found in the messiness of life? That's the question. Can God be found in the messiness of life? This spring, we've been walking through the book of Psalms. I've been choosing selected Psalms. And most recently, we've been walking through three different Psalms that detail particular points in the life of David. Two weeks ago, we found David in a cave, suffering unjustly, being persecuted solely for being a man after God's own heart. And he was utterly destitute and alone, actually mirroring the suffering of the coming Messiah. Then last week, we saw David sinned further than we ever imagined he would. His sin with Bathsheba caused utter, overwhelming consequences for sin. Can God be found in the midst of that circumstance? We found that Nathan, in the kindness of the Lord, came and confronted David. And now this morning... We will walk through Psalm 3. I'm going to narrate for you a good portion out of uh, 2 Samuel 12 through 15. What occurs in the life of David after he sins with Bathsheba, all the way up till the writing of Psalm 3. And what we will find, we're going to have church this morning, because what we're going to find is that there is forgiveness for sin, but there is shame associated with sin and the consequences of sin that cause a continual compounding of the situation. And the question again becomes, can God be found in the midst of of shame for our sin. We have the honor and privilege of taking the Lord's Supper this morning, okay? Uh, before we take it, you can raise your hand and, and deacons will come around and make sure you got those elements. But in your mind, in your heart, please know that the entire service is moving towards taking that Lord's Supper that we never want to take it in an unworthy manner. And, and the press this morning is going to be strong because here's the deal. I think most of us in here know and, and mentally comprehend what it means to be forgiven for our sin. But so many of us haven't forgiven ourselves and carry that shame around over and over, beat ourselves up with penance as if the Lord would be pleased because we continue to feel the weight of that sin and that shame. And we're going to deal with that this morning. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you because where else can we go? You who've sent your Son to enter into our shame, to enter into our mess. May your Holy Spirit have your way with us this morning. Allow us to drink deeper, more fully of the truth of the gospel. That you not only forgive our sin, but you also enter into our shame and cry out that there is hope. You are the lifter of our heads. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nathan confronts David. And the prisoner is finally set free, at least in one aspect he is. He has returned to the God of his refuge, his hiding place. He has found forgiveness and freedom. And the truth of the matter is, as we learned last week, that through the cross, all men can be justified before the holy God of heaven. Through the cross, all men have the ability to stand before God on judgment day and be declared not guilty, perfectly clean, declared righteous. But that doesn't mean that the consequences of sin do not follow. You see, David won't die, but the child will. And Bathsheba will be forced to mourn the loss of her first child. David won't die, 
But 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 10 through 12, as Nathan is, is confronting David, the word of the Lord comes and says that the sword will never depart from your house. That, that, that evil will rise up against you from within your own household. More than that, I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Truth of the matter is, is God is not mocked. If a man sows in his flesh, he will reap corruption. Forgiveness does not magically remove what awaits on the other side, the consequences of sin in every one of our lives. And as we will see, David becomes paralyzed by shame. You see, he knows it's coming. It's like he just sits there and just waits. He can only watch as it happens before him. So a few years later, David's oldest, his heir, Amnon, deceives his father about being sick and needing his half-sister, Tamar, to come and care for him. And so David sends for her. It's a devious plot to get her alone. He rapes her. Once he's done with her, he discards her like waste. You see, the sexual sins of David don't go unnoticed by his sons. Amnon, too, is a man of unbridled passion, abusing his power. The text says that David is furious but he does nothing about it. He's furious, but he never confronts or disciplines Amnon. He never comforts his daughter Tamar. See, the patriarch Jacob, he rebuked Reuben, removed the blessing upon his life for his sexual sins. But what leg does David have to stand on? So he doesn't parent, he doesn't discipline, he just buries his head in the sand. And meanwhile, Amnon flaunts with his pride. Tamar is disgraced. And Absalom, her full brother, is left to pick up the pieces. He cares for her, Absalom does. Brings her into his house. He's the one who wipes her tears but everyone the whole while is longing for David to stand up, to be the dad, to be the king. Listen, what you did was wrong, dad. We get that. But, but we are looking to you. We need your strength. Rise up. Stand on truth. Stand up for what is right and address this situation. Because your daughter needs you. Your heir is wicked, and your other sons are watching. But David chooses to do nothing. Shame has become a cloud that hovers over his head, distorting his perception, weakening his discernment. The shame of his own sin blurs his ability to parent and to act righteous. Because he's always looking through the lens of shame. It continually undercuts his resolve to stand up and to do what is right. So meanwhile, Absalom, he grows bitter and awaits revenge. He's going to begin to go down a dark path because his father will not address the situation. So two years later, after waiting, he develops and then executes a plan to kill his brother, Abnon. Afterwards, he escapes to his grandfather's house for refuge. Abnon is dead. Absalom has killed his own brother. Tamar longs for comfort from her father, and David is immobilized by shame. David mourns. 
Abnon, the loss of his heir, of his oldest, of his firstborn. And now Absalom, who's been exiled and been removed. David mourns. He wishes for Absalom to return home. He is noticeably shaken. Everyone knows what's bothering David all the while, but he never sends word. He never initiates. For three years, he does nothing but ignore it. He's haunted by the prophecy of what is coming. You see, David's paralysis actually is what is causing it all to unravel. His family is divided. But even up to this point, you get the sense that Absalom just wants to be reunited with his father. He just, they just want to be able to address it and break through and get it all out on the table. After three years of being banished, Joab is the one who has to coerce David into bringing Absalom back home. But instead of this being a family reunion where we finally deal with issues, one that's filled with, let's, let's rip off the bait, let's talk about it, let's, let, let's get it out and, and let's find the healing and forgiveness, let's at least establish the base David refuses to even see his son. For two years, Absalom will come home but be banished to his own house and David never even sees his face. Crickets. The silent treatment. Trapped in his shame of silence. So after two years, Absalom, he can't stand it anymore. You can imagine, he can't stand it. He tries to get an appointment. He begins with, with Joab, but he can't even get an appointment with Joab until he sets Joab's field on fire. That's after getting someone's attention. Well, then Joab shows up. He's like, what do you want? You guys haven't talked to me in, in three years. Actually, it's been five total. What do I have to do? It would be better if I were back at my grandfather's. Just at least I would have someone there. And so Joab talks to King David and Absalom is finally able to come before the king. Is this going to be the moment? Is this going to finally break through? David pardons Absalom almost in complete silence. No deep conversation, no addressing the issues, no, no genuine healing or just sweep everything under the rug. And at this point, Absalom is done. He's had all he can stand. And so for the next two years, Absalom will begin to conspire against his father, the king. He will begin to draw public attention to himself, all in an attempt that he is one day going to overthrow. And when he decides his opportunity has come, do you know the first person that he brings to his side? Athithophel. It's a hard one to say. It's a fun one. But if you remember from last week, that's Bathsheba's grandfather, David's trusted counselor, who sat there while his granddaughter's husband was killed, and then Bathsheba was taken into David's own palace. You think he's ready to turn on David? When David hears about the mounting opposition, that Absalom has an army, that he's coming back to usurp the throne, David simply leaves Jerusalem. He's unwilling to fight against his own son. 
and he will leave Jerusalem in a walk of shame. Uncertain about his future. Uncertain if he will ever return to the city that he built. The capital. The city of David. He leaves ten concubines to keep the house. And the rest go with him. A quick aside. Deuteronomy 17 teaches you that as you're reading your Bible... There's a warning that when, when you ask for a king and I give you a king, he is not to amass a whole bunch of wives to himself. There's a warning that's given. So as you're reading the narrative, you realize how far David has gone down, that he can leave 10 concubines back at the house. David leaves the palace In a parade of shame, he crosses over the Kidron Valley and ascends the Mount of Olives, the whole time weeping, his head covered, barefoot, as he walks ahead. Even Mephibosheth, you remember Mephibosheth, the lame descendant of Jonathan that David brought into the palace as a, as a gesture uh, to his friendship for Jonathan. Even Mephibosheth at this point has not come with David and the rumor is, is that he is waiting, hoping, thinking maybe the kingdom will return to him. Things have crumbled quickly. Most have left David's side. He leaves the city, possibly for the last time. And these words come out of his mouth. If I return, then I found favor with God. But probably, I've lost all favor with God. God has no delight in me. David is met along the road by an old, bitter man who is a descendant of King Saul. He meets him along the road and begins to yell curses at him. Murderer! Rapist! Traitor! You are getting what you deserve! You usurp the kingdom! You stole it from Saul. You're a liar. You're a fraud of a king. This is what you deserve even worse. And he follows him the whole time. You have become a curse to God. God has forsaken you. He he is, he is the one who is doing this to you. And David, head hung in shame, His only reply is, my own son fights against me. Surely God has brought him to come curse me. Think about that statement. Think about everything that is piling on and going through David's own mind and heart. God has come and cursed me. Rock bottom comes the next day when Absalom enters the king's palace. And Ahithophel's first piece of advice is you need to take those ten concubines that are left and you need to lie with them on the rooftop for everyone to see. And now David's shame has become public for everyone. Can God be found? In this sort of shame. Can God be found in your shame? I mean, let's get real for a moment because every single one of us have skeletons in our closet that when the chips really get down, your enemy loves nothing more than to pull that out and to say, Do you see this? Do you see what you've done? 
You are getting what you deserve. You are a curse to God. And we hide and hide and tell ourselves if other people actually knew all that's back there, and we become a shell of ourselves. The question is, can God be found in the midst of this shame, in your shame? The answer is yes. Yes, he can. How do you know? Psalm 3. Psalm 3. Listen to this. O oh Lord, my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. You see, everyone loves juicy gossip. And when you're the king 10 times more, right? It's hard enough to deal with your own personal stain of sin, but oh, how it compounds when it goes public. The once darling of Israel has for the past 10 years been the topic of gossip and pile on slander. I mean, just imagine the king and the way that those rumors spread. He's just getting what he deserves. And frankly, he deserves so much worse. Public shame, forever defined by your worst, frozen in time at your lowest moment, isolated and examined by the rigid letter of the law. That guilty verdict cast in cement. There is no good in him. And as the narrative is repeated over and over and over again, there is no forgiveness, there is no redemption, there is no way forward, there is no hope. Richard Nixon, although pardoned of all crimes, simply hid the rest of his life because of public shame. And once the wave of public opinion has shifted, one quickly finds himself isolated and alone. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, there is one who rushes to David's side. Seemingly when all else are exiting, Ittai the Gittite, who's the leader of a 600-person Philistine army, who has come as a mercenary army. As he meets David, David in his shame-filled exodus, as he's leaving Jerusalem, he dismisses Ittai as, as if uh, Naomi did to Ruth. Just, just, just go and, and leave. You are free from your obligation. Leave me in my shame. And in a speech that rivals Ruth, he says, where you go, I will go. Wherever you go, if you live, if you die, I will be right by your side. A friend of sinners, one might say. Someone who enters in when all others exit. As a Christian, I pray you do not abandon your friends when sin becomes ugly or it reeks of shame. For this is when they need you the most. Who will tell them the good news of Jesus Christ if not you? Who will tell them that they don't have to be defined by their guilt if not you? Jesus found Peter on the shoreline after he had denied him three times. Jesus found him and restored him. Jesus, our God, is a God who enters into our shame. Be like Jesus. Enter in. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. You hear those words? There is no salvation for him in God. When David left Jerusalem, he was dejected, weeping, cursed at. Maybe they're right. Maybe I have become a curse of God. Maybe there is no salvation for me. Satan would love nothing more than for you to believe that. 
Is he paralyzed by shame? David hangs his head based on what everyone says. But listen to me, more than that, his head hangs because he can't forgive himself. He doesn't stand up for the truth because he says to himself, how can he? That weight is always there. He beats himself up, hoping that the penance, right? If we can whip ourselves enough, if we can feel the weight, if we can constantly feel bad enough that maybe that will bring some relief to someone. But it's a lie. It's a false cycle. And it only gets heavier. Remember last week, I used the analogy, the image, that David was locked inside his own prison of sin. And Jesus came and found him, using Nathan to confront him and was liberated. But here again, we actually find that David is locked inside again his own prison, but this time a prison of shame and circumstances and public opinion and his own guilty conscience. All of it stacked against him. All of it screaming out, shame on you. Look at what you've done. Can God be found? Friend, listen to me. Jesus came and found David in the midst of this shame. I doubt your shame is quite as epic as King David's here. Jesus came and found him. How do you know? It's the difference between verse 2 and 3. Between verse 2 and 3. Look at the psalm. Verse 2. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. That's how dejected David was as he exited Jerusalem. He's filled with shame. Let them curse. God has probably brought them to curse me. But listen. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. You have never seen a God like Jesus who enters into our shame. You have never seen a God like him. Hebrews 12, 2 says that it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. I know culturally we adorn ourselves with cross necklaces and all through our houses and in our sanctuaries. And they're beautiful, they're ornate. And we easily lose the shame of the cross. But the reality is, is there is nothing more shame-filled in the entire ancient world than the cross. It was devised as the cruelest form of torture. I mean, you wouldn't walk around with a noose around your neck. The word cross was a curse word. It would not be spoken in public. No Roman dare be crucified. It was only reserved for foreign trash. As a warning sign to the worst, to the vilest, do not be like these. Because it removed all forms of humanity. Turned you into a beast. Maximizing the pain. As you wallowed in agony. Exposed. Squirming for every breath. Consider for a moment the shame that Jesus entered into. Our shame. Because of the joy that was on the other side. Consider for a moment the shame of being mocked as king. 
As he's blindfolded, as his beard is plucked out, as he's struck upon the side of the head, as a crown of thorns is mashed down onto his head and they mock him. They put a purple robe around him and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. Consider for a moment the shame of being publicly scourged. His back shredded while onlookers jeered at his pain. Consider for a moment the shame of carrying the cross down the Via de la Rosa while the public would line the streets, curse you, and spit in your face. Turn to your son and say, do not be like that man. Consider for a moment the shame of the cross. Stripped naked. Nails driven between your hands and feet. They cast lots for his clothes. And he hangs there in utter shame, labeled the vilest criminal. Consider for a moment the shame of Jesus Christ. And this scripture says he counted that shame nothing. He despised it. He spit upon it. He said that shame is nothing in comparison with the joy that awaits on the other side. For thou, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Is there a sweeter refrain in the whole of Scripture? That there we sit in our shame and the King of kings and Lord of lords comes and enters in to your shame and lifts your head. When all else abandoned, when all else run because they don't want the stench of it on them, he enters in and lifts our head. You are a shield about me. My glory. My glory. Have you thought? That is a title that is given. My glory. Not only does he lift our heads, listen, he redeems, he gives you his glory. You are already filled with compounding shame, but he who has taken on the most shame, no one has ever been shamed like him. He who entered into all that shame and came out on the other side, resurrected and ascended and sitting at the right hand of God, he offers you his glory. He lifts your head. He gives you the title, my glory. Do you hear this? It is the sweet, sweetest refrain that you will ever hear. Because there's one thing for us to be forgiven for our sin. It's another thing for us to understand and to realize that he enters into our shame. Come on now. I know what you carry around. Because I carry it around myself. And how often, how often we become paralyzed by shame. The enemy works us over and over and over again. And it is one thing to know, well, I'm forgiven on judgment day. And it's another thing to know, wait a second here, I am not a curse of God. Anything that he allows to come against me must be for my good because he said so. Because the cross, because of his son, because he is a God who enters into that shame, it's all for my good. And he has called me his glory. Beloved, as we 
move to the Lord's Supper. I need to get real for, with you for a moment because if you do not have the elements, you can raise your hand and deacons walking around will make sure that you have them. By the way, the Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel and it is reserved for those that know him as personal Lord and Savior. The scripture asks you, if, if, if you do not Know him. If you've never placed your faith in him, please let these elements pass. Because what's about to take place is a very intimate moment between us and our Lord and Savior. I want you to take the bread. I want you to look at it. See, this bread symbolizes his broken body. That his body was broken and his blood poured out as the sacrifice for your sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And listen to me. The scripture says, do not take this in an unworthy manner. I want to tell you this morning, I think one of the ways that we take this in an unworthy manner repeatedly is if you haven't forgiven yourself. If you're continuing to carry around the sting and the shame and the weight of past sins, listen to me, you're spitting in the face of Jesus Christ and you are declaring that his work on the cross is not enough. So I want to give you a moment. Don't take this if you haven't forgiven yourself. His body is enough. His blood is enough. You have been set free. So in the quietness of your heart, would you make sure that you understand the magnitude of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body. As you prepare the cup, The cup is a symbol of his promises towards you. It's a symbol of the victory that is on the other side. Yes, there are still consequences for sin, but hear me, you are not forsaken. God does not pour out his wrath upon you. Rather, he promises in discipline, to use all things for your good. That he's always working things out for your good and to shape you into the image of his son. Never his wrath. It's been satisfied on the cross. Do you believe that? Then before you take this cup, you must say in your mind, he is for me. He is for me. Isn't that good news? 
you have a moment with your Lord and Savior and say those words. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, all across this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work and drive deeper, deeper into the truth that not only do you forgive our sin, but you enter into our shame to pull us out on the other side, to give us a new name, to make us your sons and daughters in a new identity to walk out in freedom. The freedom of being a prisoner that's set free, not only from our sin, but also from the shame. That we do not have to hide. For if you have forgiven, then who can bring a charge against us? We pray this in Jesus' name. 